Hello humans. Right now, we are in the middle of a motion control shoot, which we're very excited to share with you in the near future. But for the moment, we thought this might be quite a good opportunity to just do a bit of an introduction to motion control. What that means, uh, the different kinds of kit that's available, uh, what you can use it for, and all of that kind of business. So when we talk about motion control, we're talking about the ability to control and repeat camera motion, allowing for multiple takes or element passes to be combined to give a desired effect. While you can get some really large and powerful rigs such as Milo and Bolt that can pull off really impressive fast moves for feature films and commercial work, we're going to be talking mostly about the motion control techniques more commonly used for animation, known as shoot, move, shoot, where the camera is taking still images per frame at a much slower interval. The advantages of this technique for animation and miniature effects photography is that this allows for longer exposures per frame to achieve a deeper depth of focus, allowing small things to appear big and appear to be photographed in real motion. So let's have a look at what we've got going on here. So we've got our Kessler Cine Shooter on the motion control dolly. We're using a rail system. There are different kinds of dolly tracks, not necessarily tracks, but yeah, this is what we're going with for this one. And then as you can see, we've got our Lancaster on a model mover. Now it's moving very incrementally slowly as it takes photographs. And essentially what we're creating is an image sequence that allows us to stop really far down so that we can get a really deep depth of field on our miniature, make it look big. And then we're doing long exposures. And we have uh, this one orientated in a bit more of a profile position, which means we don't have to have our blue screen board on it, which has revealed JP's glorious model mover, which you have built yourself. That's right. Wired it yourself, Cat5 wiring, <laughs> to handle all of these incredible motors and, and motions. James, take us through this, uh, this glorious thing that you've made. Yeah, well, I thought it'd be quite advantageous for us for our, our delve into motion control to have a, a model mover, a dedicated model mover and I tried to work out what would be the kind of best size and use what available parts and components that we already had here or I had. And we rebirthed the turntable. I love it. Our it's old back. turntable. Yes. So that's sitting on top of a old DSLR time-lapse slider. Mm. So that was a pretty standard rail-mounted slider with a motor attachment. Put the turntable on top of that. And then on top of the turntable itself, I've got three linear actuators, which are stepper motor controlled. They're very similar to the kind of linear actuators you have to open garage doors yeah. or reclining electric chairs and things like that. Yes, it's a sort of telescopic type action, yeah. right? Yeah, and they've got a really good holding torque and can hold and move some pretty impressive weights at mm. some good speeds. Now, what makes these slightly unique, in, instead of the big DC motors, which are the most common ones, mm. these are actually uh, stepper motor controlled, which interfaces with our system perfectly. So which stepper means, motors are kind of ideal for motion control, right? Yeah, yeah. They're very um, accurate, mm. very repeatable. Um, they have resolution settings so you can get some really fine like moves and repeatability going uh, and also they're very affordable especially when you're starting out and you're building your own rig or adapting bits from off the shelf they're they're very accessible yeah it's called a Stuart platform yeah so this is a three axis Stuart platform and you kind of see these more used for things like flight simulators yeah. or driving simulators mm, mm. Um, it's only three axis, uh, mm. but that's enough for us to give us kind of pitch, roll, yaw and lift and all that kind yeah. of stuff. So there's different kinds of model movers out there, right? Depending on what you're wanting to move and in what sort of way. Yeah. And, and so I, suppose, I feel like with this, you get something approaching something quite organic, I think. Yeah, it's quite interesting. You can get a combination of moves going on and in conjunction with how it's rigged on the turntable and the slider, also allows us to offset some of those moves so we can actually give some sweeping turns. I mean, we're doing quite subdued moves for yeah. this large, supposedly large scale plane. Yeah. But the ability is there to, to create some moves that have some quite interesting arcs and yeah. parabolic kind of trajectories and yeah. things like that. Although trickier to, I guess, kind of control because <laughs> it's not like pitch, yaw and roll are all separate no. motors and axes. <laughs> They're kind of all one thing. Yes, yeah, so the nature of a Stuart platform is pretty much pushing and pulling on board sockets and joints. So what we don't have 
yet is a <laughs> it's a very clear defined way of of labeling those axes we're kind of like at the moment just pushing sliders and guessing which direction it goes uh, but there is ways that we can model that in the future yeah and actually have something that we can more finitely control right okay so you could create a program or get a program where where you can tell it what yeah that's perfect pitch your yeah. and all of that okay yeah. nice i think that's roll and so as you can see, there are a number of cables going into this mover. Each one of them controls a servo or motor. Are those kind of terms interchangeable? They're technically two different types of motors. Right, We're using okay. stepper motors. We could, right. we could be using servo motors, which is a different type that can interface with the system that we've got. Mm. Um, there's pros and cons to, to both. Right, okay. um, for our purposes, it's been a lot cheaper to set up using, using stepper motors yep. um, and a lot more accessible to, to uptake. Okay, so wiring wise, there's some different signals that need to be sent to each motor, right? Yes. So you've got essentially something that is power, something that is direction one way, direction another way, etc. And so um, all of these signals are being controlled via DragonFrame, which is a piece of software. And we also have one of their control boxes. The DMC32. DMC32. <laughs> we want to send an enormous thank you to DragonFrame for sending us their DMC32. There's a 32 channel control box that is obviously hooked up to the software. And then we can have 32 channels, each one operating a different motor. And so what this has enabled us to do is have a setup like this. And we're not using anywhere near all the channels that we possibly could. It's not just motors that you can have connected to this. It's lights, DMX. There's lots of different things that you can control and pre-program. This is largely used for animation, but what's nice is we're not doing that. So essentially we're programming in all of those moves and then we're just pressing go and it just does it. We're not having to go between every frame and move a little face, uh, which is, you know, that's also impressive and, and uh, but just we're not into it. Uh, uh, but yeah, what this has enabled us to do is, is, is create repeatable moves so that we can do different lighting passes. And so, you know, we'll run an entire move and then we'll go back and like, right, okay, let's do the key light, let's do the blue screen so we can get our mat, right, let's do a fiery pass or, or whatever. Okay, so let's talk through the software a little bit. Obviously, you've been building this thing. Mm -hmm. And so you've been then getting into Dragon Frame. You've wired that box, yes. um, which is pretty impressive. <laughs> it's a lot uh, of wires, a lot of trip hazards. A lot hazards. of cabling. I just tidy up the cables. That's, that's, that's my role. And I've been kind of learning as well. Um, yeah, like it's got some quirks we found. And also one of the things that's tricky as well is with, with different bits of kit, we have found that I think particularly the track dolly motor has been giving Dragon Frame some issues. So I'm not going to pretend that we've literally just plugged it all in and then it's all great. There are some problems and like, you know, it's what happens when you start mixing kit made by these people and stuff made by these people and inevitably you're going to come up with yeah. some, some niggles, right? Yeah, it's also the trade-off that you have when you start incorporating DIY into the equation. Our main thrust for doing that is obviously budget and making something that is a bit more bespoke to the kind of work that we want to do. Because yeah. the thing with, for example, modern movers is there are products out there that you can buy that can do that kind of thing and mm. they can cost a lot of money. Mm. But even the higher budget facilities that might do motion control on a regular basis probably want to build their own anyway, just so they can have full space specification and 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 uh, build of, of exactly what they need yeah. to do and then knowledge of how to maintain it and troubleshoot. yeah and i think that's a common theme as well with with either animation studios or, or effects facilities that might do motion control it's quite a broad spectrum term which involves or can incorporate live action stop motion uh, lots of different variations on those themes and a lot of facilities want to actually build or custom the kit to their needs. Yeah, sure. So yes, there are a lot of off-the-shelf components and parts and software and everything, but more often than not, you'll find a bit of an amalgamation of a bit of everything. Yeah. It's also, I think it's, a, it's, it's fair to kind of point out where we've come, right? In terms of where this kind of stuff started. I mean, it started before uh, before Star Wars, but, but if, if we take that as the kind of the really kind of gold standard in the early days you know they spent i don't know i think 
uh, stories vary a little bit, but somewhere between one and a half to two million dollars in 1976 or five, depending on when it is that they started, um, to get to a stage where we are now. Um, and it sort of goes without saying we haven't spent anywhere near that much money. And so, you know, it, it's quite amazing how much more accessible all of this it's is. It's incredibly accessible, and I think largely part to um, the development in CNC yeah. machinery and the accessibility of that and things like 3D printers uh, being, being more and more affordable because the hardware and the software that used to uh, both control and physically move these machines just has got cheaper and cheaper yeah. and it's a lot more easier now to code yourself and code uh, language that you can control things like stepper motors or servo motors and there's also a great community online of, mm -hmm. of uh, forums and builders basically that want to make some interesting projects so pretty much what we're doing here today could be thought of as an extension of controlling uh, a laser cutter or, or a CNC machine it's the same kind of theory that you program in your moves uh, to to operate a program or operate your your thing that you want to do and you just send those signals to a motor and yeah. it does its thing yeah 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 and so back to dragon frame and how that kind of works and so in terms of motion control uh, and how you program that it's really a sort of keyframing sort of system yeah. isn't it and i'm sure a lot of those watching will be familiar with the term keyframing it's sort of a catch-all term for creating one move to another move and, and and it sort of applies in lots of different softwares with slightly different contexts or meanings it could be you know a digital move on something that you've actually filmed just like go from this point to this point zoom in this much or track left or right or or whatever and it's the same principle really isn't it you get a timeline yeah. uh, and you sort of set your motor so okay i want you to start here and i want you to start here and you start there and then you say and then at this point after this many seconds i'd like you to go to there and it will do that and then you can choose the different kind of methods of movement whether it's feathered whether it's a hard stop all of that kind of thing and so it's quite intuitive and the other thing i would say about dragon frame as well is if there's anyone out there who are kind of thinking about do i want this do i want to get into animation or motion control they have a youtube channel and so i would actually say go on to the youtube channel and you can just watch loads of tutorials that dragon frame have put out and what that gives you as much as anything as well as kind of knowledge of how it works you kind of get a sense of what it does and how you know all the different yeah. things that you can do with it so if you're not quite sure whether it's right for you just go and watch some of their tutorials and you'll get a really good sense of what you can do with dragon and frame. download the demo download the the, yeah. the demo software because it's very intuitive to to pick up and learn and like you said if you're familiar with even the basics of uh, of either video editing or animation. There's enough in there to give you enough clues to get quite a good head start. Right now we're shooting this, this gorgeous Lancaster model, 132 scale model, and this is kind of a sort of test shoot. The film is kind of in its early stages of funding and the shooting a bit, and the director's really keen for us to do some practical effects and kind of keep it in that old school style, which we're obviously down with. And it's, it's been really fun. And once we've gotten over our niggles, you know, all of this kit together, the Kessler kit, Dragon Frame, the, the kit that JP's put together, man, we've done what, uh, on some shots, five or six or seven passes. Yeah. And initial looks suggest that it is lining up really just on the money perfect you know pixel perfect and that's that's awesome yeah it's encouraging and i think this is kind of like the tip of the iceberg of how far we could push it yeah. the scope of motion control is is very wide yeah and it's think, not just effects right or no. it's not just stop motion yeah and i think we've already identified some interesting avenues we might want to pursue and push it towards mm. that perhaps hasn't, hasn't been done much. Mm. And like mm. you said, we're very grateful for Dragon Frame for giving us the kit to enable to do that. And also Kessler as well for now supporting Dragon Frame yes. in their cine shooter head, which is amazing. Yeah, quite exciting times. Yeah, very much so. There's multiple applications for this kind of kit and it doesn't all have to be stop motion. You can do live action multiple passes where you can have some, some really good fun. And there's some great examples in, in movies where you've had, you know, the the same actor playing multiple characters interacting with themselves whilst including a nice camera move that just makes it feel less 
you know, locked off effects shotty. And there's there's commercial applications with motion control and there's, there's all kinds of wonderful pre-programmed shots and lighting passes that you can do with products and things like that. So if, let's say someone is looking to get into motion control, albeit for live action, animation, effects, whatever, where's a good place to start in terms of what kind of kit they might need Let's say they don't necessarily want to spend too much money to, you know, kind of get their heads around things. Yeah. What would you, where, where are some good, good places to start? I think the internet's a very good resource nowadays. For Always a good place to start. Finding such things. Um, I guess ultimately to figure out what you might want to do. So there's lots of off the shelf solutions that you can buy. Yeah. Uh, from different companies such as Kesla, Elder Crone. Adele Crone. Adele Crone. There you go. Black Forest Motion. They all have off-the-shelf sliders, pan tilt heads, more kind of tailored for, yes, they can do live action. They can yep. do a bit of everything, really. Yep. Um, time lapse, stop motion. Some of them integrate into other programs such as Dragon Frame. Yep. Some of them don't. Yep. There's a few caveats with off-the-shelf systems. Look into forums as well. If you're interested into building your own or programming your own mm. systems. There's lots of resources out there for that too. And it can be very, probably the most affordable entry yeah. method yeah. if you either have the ability or you're willing to learn things like scripting, coding, and um, wiring Arduino mm. uh, boxes and boards and things like that. But it's all very accessible and all the information is out there. Mm. There's things like Facebook groups, you yeah. know, uh, I'm a member of the DIY motion control Facebook group and there's some great members on there that post, you know, whether their builds and how they did it and everyone's kind of different. There's a few reoccurring build designs that people tend to do, yeah. but what's great about it is people share information and mm. share where they source components from and it's all about kind of a greater community of getting to terms of how to build these kind of things in an affordable yeah. way. So we thought we'd give a little indicator of what we mean by affordable. We've got a sort of a bit of a scale on the on the sort of the, the, the more affordable side of things when it comes to motion control. Um, we've kind of got three systems here. Obviously, we've got the Cine Shooter, uh, and that's what we're using for our motion control stuff for the Lancaster shoot. Uh, pan tilt head, this supports Dragon Frame mm -hmm. now, which is amazing, which enables us to then you know, rig it to larger setups. Um, and we don't really need to go into too much on this, because obviously there's a very exciting episode where we'll be enjoying this a lot. Um, so yes, Cine Shooter from Kessler is, is way cool, and we've been having a lot of fun with that. I'm going to pop this down now. And with that, you have um, you know great build quality, uh, something that can interface with things like Dragon Frame. But we'll go into more details yeah, in our and, other episode. And, and certainly repeatability of moves as well. We found that that head is actually is, is really great. It's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. I, th I think when we did our aerial show, we did something like <laughs> 70 passes, and it literally boom, 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 yeah. pixel perfect. So well done, Kessler. Yeah. Then here we've got, I'm sure a lot of folks have seen these, which is uh, made by Edelkrone. Um, and I got one of these years ago. And these kind of came out of the DSLR kind of revolution, didn't they? Mm. And what Edelkrone have done really well, I think, which is make things portable, easy to use. I mean, I think, I think those are their two main sort of goals, aren't they, really? Yeah. And they are well made. They're quite rigid, good quality materials. Um, and as I say, very portable. And the idea of this one is it literally sits on a, um, on a tripod, so it's easy to mount. And then this one, you actually sort of get double the track for you know, the amount of space that it's ultimately taking. And you just get a nice kind of little hard case that goes with that. And then what's nice is you can then add modules to it, which we have, but I couldn't find them. So let's not worry about that. So you can have like a module on here that just drives this, and it can control it. And so that's really good for time lapse and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And then you've got, uh, they do a pan tilt head, which sits up on top. And you add another module to power that, and that'll do things like target you know, tracks and things yep. like that. And, uh, and you can use it for live action. Um, I have done um, kind of a, a couple of live action sort of motion control shots. In terms of repeatability, um, I've had issue, but I think that's partly because 
it's sitting on top of a single tripod. And oh. so you, you can kind of get issues with like arching. And so, you know, if you've got a heavy camera on it, that can be a problem. So generally it's kind of for lightweight cameras, predominantly DSLRs, but obviously, you know, the Pocket Black Magics are pretty lightweight and, and they'll sit on there quite happily. Um, so yes, well done. Metal Grind. And they've done a great job in their design because they've expanded their range quite, quite considerably mm. recently with the, the, the products that they do. Uh, but I think it's worth mentioning with that, there is a certain limitation in terms of you're buying into their ecosystem a little bit. Yes. So things like yeah. track length and uh, motors, being able to swap motors and modules around. Although you can do and configure into different setups, mm. it's within the range of what they yeah, supply. Yeah, it's sort of a closed system, isn't yeah. it? Um, which is which is fine. And, and also it's, it's, it's designed to be really, really simple. And, and, and on, the, on the modules, it really is a case of, it will do the calculations for you. So mm. you will literally say, okay, I want my time lapse, let's say, to be five minutes long, uh, and I want to shoot from this time to this time. And you just kind of put those things in, it calculates it and does it. Uh, and so, you know, if you want to get tricksy with kind of long shutter mm. uh, kind of exposures and things, it doesn't account for that. It's not necessarily triggering the camera. And so, yeah, there's, there's, there's a degree of complexity you don't get, which can be good, but also there are limitations as a result of that. Uh, and I think that dovetails nicely into what we kind of want to set up is that a good uh, choice to make early on if you want to get into motion control is to work out what you might want to delve into first. So for example, if you're excited about doing time lapse, there's lots of systems out there that are perfectly tailored for doing time lapse. They can be portable, lightweight and uh, battery powered as well. That's another yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and also take you know medium to low payloads, so D DSLRs or, or, or small mirrorless cameras, things like that. Mm. No problem. Mm. Um, it's another thing to consider maybe when looking around for products and off the shelf solutions, because not all of them might be suited to what you you want. If you if you're into time lapse and animation, you've got a lot of options. But if you wanted to do video or um, more real time moves. Mm. Uh, there's other systems out there that can incorporate that and might be a slightly better product to choose. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's tricky as well because it's sort of dependent on certain shots that you might yeah. want to get at any one time and you might invest in a system and then find yourself with a project where it's like, oh, no, I need to get that. Oh, this would be great. And then you realize, oh, no, it's not quite what I need. Um, and so I don't, you know, and I don't think you can necessarily hire a lot of these things. They're generally at that price point where you pretty much got to buy it. Mm. You probably, you know, hiring houses won't really do it. No. They'll only kind of generally uh, uh, support the high end stuff, the expensive stuff. Although actually hiring motion control, uh, you know, that's that's a tricky one. And um, yeah, I have been able to hire a motion control system previously, and I think that's partly just because we're, we're in Bristol where there's a lot of time-lapsing going on uh, because of the natural history unit that is based here, uh, David Attenborough and all of that. Um, and so that was how I was able to get a really long track. Um, but again, I was wanting to do it as a kind of using it for multi-pass, and it wasn't really made for that, and I found that my passes didn't really line up. And so... Yeah, th this is why there are systems that aren't so expensive. And then you know, the jump from yeah. sort of affordable to a couple hundred thousand pounds for a unit. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, when you get to your bolts. Um, and they have done a sort of sort of mini bolt system, but it's still phenomenally expensive. You, you wouldn't buy it. You would hire it. Um, but again, bolts have their, have their, you know, not issues, but, you know, you get a bolt and you just the rigging of that mm. uh, and generally because they're, they're usually used for sort of high speed moves yeah. and things like that you've got to bolt those things to the ground and so it's not like you could carry that up a mountain uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so horses for courses um and so the next thing that uh, we want to show is this little guy. yeah it brings us nicely to the subject of as you progress you might want to then get into doing more live action mm. or more refined version of stop motion or, mm. or time lapse even. Black Forest Motion do this controller, which is the Pine or the Pine 2 that we have. And what's great about this is this is basically a brain, yeah. electronic brain that you can control via app or even a PS4 controller. Mm. So uh, they make the app for this, yeah? Yes. And what's great about this is this can, can control third party motors, mm. it can control motors that you buy just off the shelf. 
uh, stepper motors. And with the user interface of the app and the control software, you can configure your own setups. Yeah, yeah. So if you have, like I have, a time-lapse slider that was my first investment, was a time-lapse slider and head. That's the head here. And our slider we're currently using on our modern meter. Yeah. I kind of got lucky because, it, as it turns out, the company that made that, which is separate from Black Forest, actually have these modular components. So things like the motor and the hardware, you can actually take apart, reconfigure. Mm. The motors especially, you can swap those out and you can interchange them. And the great thing about this controller is that you can control a lot of motors, a lot of different configurations. So you can really then start to customize and build a system that perhaps is better suited to you. Yeah, yeah. And again, we're, we're talking about shoot, predominantly shoot, move, shoot setups here. So things that are incrementally shot frames that will then produce motion video. Yeah. If you want something that will uh, is more capable of doing live action or high speed moves, mm. that's a different kettle of fish. Mm. That's where you are looking more likely to spend the bigger bucks. Yeah. There's a hardware box and software called Mantis, which is out there, which is kind of an industry standard. And that's really well accepted in the industry to allow truly customized rigs and truly integrated systems using lots of non-proprietary components. It's mm. very open source in that regard. Um, so you can really just build what you want. Yeah. And you can do that with this. You can, yes. So you can still hook this up to uh, like the track that we have our model mover on, yes. you could extend that track. And so you can still do, uh, you know, long tracking moves, yep. motion controlled, repeatable. Um, but yeah, it's really when you get towards the high speed side of things, which I think is fair to say that those are those are very niche. Still specialized. Yeah, yeah. and there's only really that many times you're going to need to do something at high speed in mm. terms of the move, which almost certainly would be if you're shooting at very high frame rates, mm -hmm. with a Phantom or something like that. And that's kind of commercial side of things where you're doing like wacky product shots, burgers flipping around and spinning around them or whatever. Pancakes. Uh, pancakes. Um, and, uh, or yeah, it's just some like wild shot in a movie. Yep. Um, whereas if you're looking to do a sort of long motion control tracking shot, you can still use this. Oh, definitely. And, and again, that, what's great about this is you can expand it. Uh, you can even daisy chain them. This, this individual controller has uh, four outputs and two camera triggers. So you can interface. I mean, that's the main part of what we're calling kind of motion control is the ability to not only control, play back, repeat, uh, customize uh, motion with mm. motors and, mm. and controllers, it's also to trigger the camera. Yes. So that's the, a very obviously a very important part um, that you also might want to look at and work out, OK, what camera might I want to use on my setup? Does it need to be portable? This has the ability to be DC powered off the mains or battery powered. So you, this could be taken up a mountain yep. with a rig that you either build or, or buy or configure yourself. It's just very flexible. And this also interfaces with Dragon Frame. Yes. So this will appear as a separate uh, controller that we can trigger with our other systems, mm, mm. which is great. Nice. And again, that's a non-proprietary base. And I'd recommend that as an off-the-shelf starting piece that will be able to be expanded as and when you might need to. Yeah, so it gives you the most opportunity to vary your setup. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. And then on the cheaper than this scale, Ooh. the more adventurous of you <laughs> out there who might be very savvy or uh, open to learning things like G-code or scripting and things like that with things like Arduino project boards. Yeah. You can actually program the actual circuit boards to run stepper motors, which basically incorporate a driver to talk to those motors. So G-code initially is kind of created for CNC motors. Yeah, it's the programming language used for CNC machines and things like that. And it's quite a universally acknowledged um, language. Mm. So there's lots of tutorials out there, lots of, lots of information online about how to to code such things and control things. And people have, yeah, it's, it's beyond my pay grade to understand it fully, but there's lots of people out there that do. And I think that'd be the most uh, affordable um, e entry level of this kind of stuff, because you'd be able to buy and source the, the, the very bare bones components very cheaply yeah. to get you up and running. Yeah. And that might be enough for you to understand how the concept works and how much you might want to invest if you want to take it further. Mm. 
and you haven't had to do such a big outlay m monetary wise mm -hmm. of um, investing in any of these yeah. off the shelf it's, systems. It's always that, that there's a triangle, isn't there, <laughs> in terms of cost versus time versus quality. And, and yeah, if you want to save money, you're almost certainly going to have to invest more time. And so, you know, it's really just kind of what can you afford? Uh, but also not just, you know, sometimes you might just want to go, even if you could afford something more expensive, you might want to go, you know, right at the base level, yeah. learn the coding. And then, you know, really you're setting yourself up to be more flexible, right? Yeah, and, and you're always going to, your knowledge is always an additive thing, right? So, I mean, when I first started dipping my toes into motion control, I, I kind of knew the basics, but... Subsequently, I've learned, you know, Cat5 wiring and relatively advanced things, um, but um, I'm not a genius. So if I can do it, <laughs> a lot of people out there can. And again, that's using a combination of these kind of more entry level systems mm. and uh, the more affordable end of hardware that you can buy. And that really taught me the fundamentals of, you know, the importance of, OK, mechanically, how does that work and mechanically what? might I need it to hold up to mm. on a bigger scale yeah. shoot. So it's a um, base level of understanding yeah. that you won't get if you buy something that's doing a lot of the work for you, which exactly. is which which can be fine. But yeah, yeah, as like you say, it's an additive learning. And all of these things are great to know if you have the time to learn. Well, that probably wraps it up. Um, we hope you enjoyed our little foray into uh, into motion control. Do keep an eye out for this episode that is upcoming where we're going to be shooting multiple passes of our amazing Lancaster bomber along with some pyrotechnics and all kinds of joy. Remember to follow us on social media if, you, you know, if it doesn't make you sad. Uh, and we have a Patreon running so you can go there and support us in that way. Um, I think that's pretty much it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Good.